Hi, I'm Peter Bergen. Uh, thanks for attending this event. Um, we're lucky to have Candice Rondo, who's uh, Senior Director for Future Frontlines and Planetary Politics at New America, author of a forthcoming book on the Wagner Group, uh, published by Public Affairs. Uh, also a professor of practice at Arizona State and part of the Center of the Future of War at ASU. And also Ben Dalton, who's a program manager at Future Frontlines, previously worked at BuzzFeed and the International Crisis Group. So let's just dive straight in. Um, I guess it uh, seems that Prigozhin has landed in Belarus, according to some news reports. So Candice, uh, is he going to get a warm reception? Is he going to get uh, put in jail? What's going to happen? Candice, I think you're on mute. Sorry, um, he seems to have slipped the news this time. You know, warm reception is debatable. I think um, we don't really know yet exactly what circumstances he's being held under. Uh, he seems to be more or less free to operate in Minsk. Uh, we assume he's in Minsk, but again, we don't know that either. Uh, as you know, Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, uh, is an extremely um, sort of, you know, a man who's very tight with facts and has managed to keep a lid on the uh, on the news environment, the information environment in Belarus for the better part of 20 years. Uh, I mean, basically, he's kind of the um, lesser twin brother of, of uh, Vladimir Putin in the sense that he's, you know, the, the dictator next door. And so we don't know, actually, a lot about the circumstances there. But we do know that um, Prigozhin uh, released a statement saying, uh, essentially, that Wagner would be operating uh, from Belarusian territory, which seems to say and signal that um, it doesn't really matter what happened with uh, the, the mutiny that happened over the weekend. And in fact, um, he will not be punished. He might even be rewarded for everything that occurred uh, that seems to have shaken the foundations of, of Russia's society. Um, yeah, in, in another context, Churchill said it's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. Is this the um, <laughs> end of the beginning for Putin or, you know, or is he, you know, he's done such a good job of quashing any kind of dissent um, that he is, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it's a, no one knows, including Putin, but what's your take, Candice, about like what this has done for him uh, personally? Yeah, I mean, the, the response from Putin has been so weak, um, and I think everybody kind of will universally say um, that they would have expected an iron fist from Putin, and instead what we saw was just kind of uh, non-action, inertia, almost a kind of paralysis that seemed to occur, and then, um, you know, after the fact, this very weak uh, statement that he gave, it was a very short little um, speech that he gave saying, well, you know, uh, that was a terrible thing that happened, but, you know, we're going to drop the charges anyway. It's It was a really confusing message. And I think the one thing we can say about Vladimir Putin is that he's been pretty on message for the better part of his 24-year reign, right? So uh, I've never really seen a moment where, um, you know, Vladimir Putin hasn't controlled the narrative fully. Um, he is definitely not writing this chapter of Russia's history right now. One thing I'm fascinated by the Ben or Candace, I mean, to the extent that you can have a polling in Russia, which is kosher, which seems there seems to be there is some possibility. The war has been pretty popular, and and uh, as far as I can tell, so uh, you know what 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 is what is state TV? What is you know what 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 are the what is the Russian propaganda saying about all this? Because it seems like it would have to perform quite a lot of uh, interesting moves to kind of make sense of all this. Yeah, listen, I mean, I I know Ben's been tracking this, so I want to hear from him for sure. But I, I think it's really weird to watch um, these like kind of state backed outlets like Sputnik and RT. Uh, I mean, we saw some really strange stories about like a man who happened to share the name Prigozhin saying that he was going to take his, um, I guess, his mother's maiden name and, because he was so embarrassed to be associated with the name Prigozhin. It was like the weirdest spin I have ever seen. Um, and so, I mean, it seems like like the state TV apparatus is in no way like coordinated with what's going on online. Um, it's just, it, it's completely busted apart the entire uh, state-backed propaganda machine, right, Ben, I think? Yeah, you've seen uh, these anchors perform these just bizarre 
like 180s, right? Where a week ago they were singing the praises of, of Wagner and Prigozhin uh, as being like the most effective fighting force that Russia has in Ukraine and so forth. And then on Saturday, all of a sudden they're traitors <clears throat> and now they're somewhere in between. It's it's a very strange situation. And yeah, for the for the state backed TV, uh, they're just they're just turning on a dime and you know whatever impression that gives, uh, they, they seem not to mind. And then there's the, the second stream of Russian media, which um, a lot of that actually happens on the social media platform, Telegram, um, where people uh, are sort of equally uh, confused and, and taken aback by this series of events. One thing I noticed is, so Prigozhin communicates a lot through these uh, voice memos that he releases on his personal Telegram channels. And the voice memo that he released on Saturday announcing that his column is going to turn around got something like 400,000, 500,000 other like clown emojis, um, which is actually a very <laughs> negative uh, response. Yeah. I saw that too. That was super hilarious. I saw one comment. I'm sorry. It, it's, it's, it's weird to think this is comical, but there are these comical elements to this very dark story. Um, somebody in like one of the, the comments said, you know, the clowns have left, but the circus goes on. Right. It was like the most, you know, apt, I think, description of exactly what's going on in these last couple of weeks. I mean, well, that, that was because the, the headquarters of the MOD in Rostov is apparently located right across the street from the literal Rostov circus. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so one one question is about Putin himself. I mean, my understanding is that he doesn't really understand. Uh, he obviously understands TV because that's the kind of propaganda uh, I mean, that's that's the media he grew up with, but he doesn't seem to really understand social media and he may not have understood, you know, kind of the environment around Prigozhin and the Wagner group and the extent to which Prigozhin was able to communicate and bypass him. And what can you reflect a little bit about about that issue? Yeah. And Putin's understanding of of. Uh of social media and how it can yeah. be I you know I don't know if I fully agree with that I think certainly he he does he does seem like in this kind of split screen reality where he's forced to do the things that he grew up doing right like he saw of course he grew up seeing uh, you know uh Khrushchev and you know uh later Gorbachev on TV making these you know big sort of almost like robotic you know, statements and these kind of, uh, you know, big scenes and, and uh, tableaus, as it were. And of course, he's used that to a great effect, I think, to kind of sort of sense, you know, give the sense that I am the state. It's very imperial and almost czarist in nature. Yeah, that doesn't really play so well on social media. That's just, I think the reality is, you know, there are certain types of political ideologies that play well on social media and some that don't. Right. And that's one of the things that he failed at is understanding how to flip the script. And that's why he relied on Prigozhin so much. Prigozhin did understand that there was this whole emergent kind of super conservative um, Christian Orthodox uh, base that he could play to. And frankly, he had the backing of you know several uh, very important oligarchs like uh, Konstantin Malafeya, who's of course one of the best examples of that, um, head of Marshall Capital, one of the biggest backers of um, some of the contingents that were sent into Crimea back in 2014. You know, I mean, so I think, you know, Putin in a way was sort of um, outsourcing a lot of that work to Prigozhin, and that was his great utility. May I ask you, how have the sort of the liberal opposition to Putin reacted to all this? Because it must put them in a bit of a bind, because you know, obviously they're opposed to Putin, but Prigozhin is, uh, you know, hardly um, uh, a liberal Democrat in his sort of impulses and worldview. Yeah, Ben, what do you think? I mean, you've seen this kind of play out, too. Yeah, I mean, they have not been major players in this drama. Um, Prigozhin speaks to as Candace just said, this enormous, not a majority, I don't think, but a very large minority of the Russian population that has these sort of ultra-conservative, oftentimes ultra-Orthodox views. Um, and that group of people is very, very angry about um, what they see as sort of feckless, ineffective uh, prosecution of this war in Ukraine. And uh, Prigozhin, for, for months now, has been giving them um, a scapegoat. It's not, you know, 
the, the Russian fighting forces, it's these the corrupt bureaucrats who sit at the top of the Ministry of Defense, uh, specifically Shoigu and Grasimov, but the implications that the entire sort of top of, of MOD is kind of rotten. Um, and that resonates because probably it's to some extent true. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as, yeah, I mean, I think Putin has kind of hinted at this for many, you know, many years as part of his career is that, you know, what comes after him is not going to be some like nice Western facing liberal uh, in yeah. all likelihood. It's going to be somebody who's even more sort of militaristic mm-hmm. and, and hard line. Well, we mentioned a Gerasimov, you know, I mean, because if we let's rewind the tape five years, you know, Gerasimov was supposed to be this brilliant guy and he had this sort of like new approach to warfare and sort of the gray zone and stuff that Candace has been working on for a long time. So he seems to have been strangely absent from a lot of this. What What is the deal with him? Is he, you know, where is he now? Is he damaged? What? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, actually. He has been way off camera. Uh, yeah. I think it's really interesting just in the last, you know, 24 hours that we've seen whatever that strange footage was with Sergei Shoigu, like um, flying in a plane over over some battlefield. It looked very uh, contrived and possibly even like some old footage. We don't really know yet. Um, it is it is interesting that we don't see the same effort being made to kind of show that Val- Valery Gerasimov is like, on the scene, ready to go, uh, you know, doing the thing. On the other hand, that never really was his role. He was always kind of, I think, I always think of him as the, as the, um, the kind of pen version of, you know, the Russian way of war. Whereas Shoigu was a little bit more the camera version. Uh, that's kind of, I don't know, Ben. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, Shoigu is is fascinating. He's such a survivor. He's I believe the longest serving Russian official in close proximity to Putin in, you know, one of the very few who's been in power since like back way back in the 90s. Um, and Gerasimov clearly does prefer to operate a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and, yeah, you know, and sorry to interrupt, but I'll just say the, the chief difference between them is Gerasimov is a military guy, genuinely a military guy. Yeah. Shoigu is not right. Like he did not serve. He did not come up in rank. Uh, he only has like a, a civilian equivalent in terms of rank and title. So I think that's another contrast. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of speculation as to whether this is the end of Shoigu. But as of today, he was just appearing in a meeting with Putin. There was some rumor about him getting another award. So <laughs> you know, that trend of, of Shoigu not getting ousted and, and staying close to power seems to be continuing. Yeah. We're, we're getting some questions coming in. So uh, anybody in the audience, uh, just put put the questions in Slido and I'll uh, uh, ask Candice and Dan to. So first question is, could the Wagner Group rebellion be a ploy to get an army into Belarus uh, for a invasion of Ukraine north from Bill Petrarca? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. Uh, It's important to remember that one of the kind of unseen ties between the Wagner Group and the official military is the VDV, um, Airborne Assault Forces, which actually have been based, uh, you know, in Belarus for, you know, since basically even the Soviet times. There's always been that connection there. Um, Vitebsk is actually like a really important uh, operating base. And, And Minsk, of course, is another kind of key logistical hub for the transfer of weapons and goods that are moving um, into Ukraine. We, we, for instance, uh, um, you know, you might remember at the beginning of uh, the invasion last year, we had these two different symbols uh, appearing on, you know, tanks and like infantry infer- uh, fighting vehicles. One was Z, which of course has now been, you know, the very famous symbol of uh, the Russian special operation. And then the other was um, uh, Vostok, right? So V. And that V was for direction from Belarus um, into, so moving east into uh, and sweeping around uh, into Kiev. And, uh, you know, I was given to understand that actually Wagner forces came through that line um, through an airdrop, basically, uh, at the outset of the war. I know that there were also, we also have written about this, the presence of um, some of these detachments like Rusich that are related or part of kind of the Wagner sh- sort of umbrella, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and they inserted uh, in the Northeast in Kharkiv. 
So there were probably a few different places, but Belarus was extremely important for the opening of this war, and it probably will be very important for the closing of it too. One thing I would just add to that also is um, there's like a weird dimension of having like presumably a very significant part of the Wagner core relocated and, and based in Belarus, which is, um, you know, Lukashenko gave an address today where he basically said, don't worry, these guys are not, not, aren't going to do to me what they just, you know, maybe came close to doing in Russia. We know how to keep them under control. They're going to be training our soldiers, which is such a strange turn. So as recently as 2020, three years ago, um, Lukashenko was so paranoid of, of these guys that when 33 of them turned up in Minsk as part of this extremely elaborate Ukrainian intelligence operation, he believed that they had been sent by Putin to depose him. And now he's, he's in three years found his way to like being so comfortable with them that he's going willing to host a much, much larger presence. It's a, it's it's a little so, strange. It's so yeah. weird. I mean, because I, what I also think is weird is the way Lukashenko is like, oh yeah, I've known Prigozhin for like 30 years, which I think is probably not wrong. It's probably true that like Lukashenko has been to many a state dinner uh, or even like sort of uh, some sort of shuttle diplomacy where he has rocked up in Moscow or St. Petersburg and had dinner with Putin or somebody, you know, very normal, right? Um, that the, you know, the chief caterer for the Kremlin would be present for something like that. But did he know him, know him? That seems a little bit of a stretch, I think, right? What is his background, Lukashenko? I mean, is he just a sort of old style party boss who sort of kind of survived or what? what where is yeah, he? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's the basic story. Um, I mean, he he is a survivor um, in the same way as, as Putin. They're kind of contemporaries, um, you know, part of the services, uh, but I would categorize him as perhaps... Um, much less manufactured. He's really the manufacturer of the Kremlin more than uh, the manufacturer of Minsk, although I'm sure there's a little bit of a mix there. They still have a KGB, uh, which should tell you a lot about the system of government there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, it seems, you know, obviously it's early days, but it seems to have not been particularly effective. Um, and has, I mean, if, if Wagner is sort of off the field to some degree, or and even, I don't even know if that's the case, but I mean, is there, you know, that's a pretty large element uh, of, of, I mean, and, and what do you, I, I've seen numbers of 25,000 that I heard somebody else sort of using the figure 8,000. I mean, is there, is there, seen, is there a regional we've number? 20, we've seen 2,500. I mean, we've seen all kinds of numbers, honestly. You saw that the other day. I mean, it was really, look, the numbers are all over the map. I would not um, judge from the numbers, like uh, the full effect of, of what may occur or what it means in terms of where then the Ukrainian offensive, counteroffensive stands. I also, this will sound a little controversial to those who are a little bit more dug in on the kind of military technical aspects uh, of examining the war, the sort of tactical pieces. From my perspective, the Ukrainians have played the psychological warfare violin uh, with kind of a virtuoso expertise here. Um, I, I really think we have probably seen the insertion of a lot of interesting information that is intercepted, um, you know, dropped in different places, leaks, hacks, all kinds of stuff that has been extremely important to undercutting Prigozhin's ability to um, control the narrative, and that is. That's not insignificant. I mean, yes, trench warfare, totally get it. Yes, bullets, yes, ammunition, yes, artillery. But honestly, the Ukrainians have absolutely mastered, I think on some level, the psychological war warfare aspects. Um, and here, this is, uh, you know, uh, Budana, of course, who is the, the head, the chief of military intelligence for Ukraine. Um, I think there are a lot of credit goes to him in some ways for, um, not getting in the way of, you know, Prigozhin's kind of self-inflicted uh, wounds. Yeah. N Napoleon oh. famously said, uh, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one, one thing I might just quickly add uh, to sort of the implications for the, the war in Ukraine. So uh, as far as we, we know, um, Wagner had already withdrawn from the front lines after they had essentially captured the, the the, the city of Bakhmut, uh, which, you know, was incredibly costly for them. Um, so they had withdrawn uh, to their rear operating bases to recover a bit. And Prigozhin was talking about returning some point later in the summer. Um, 
I think that's all now very much in doubt. Um, and one thing that I keep thinking about is, um, you know, the Wagner guys shot down something like seven aircraft, Russian military aircraft, and killed something like 15 Russian servicemen. Um, and Putin seems to be currently willing to just sort of like put that in the past. But I would be surprised if regular Russian soldiers are going to be quite as easy to forgive the fact that these guys now have you know, Russian blood in their hands. So it's a huge open question to me how they're going to like effectively fight because you know they're they're not facing this decision whether to basically go into exile with Prigozhin in Belarus or to sign a contract that would effectively incorporate them into the Russian command structure. Um, how are they going to fight together? How are they going to how is how are those uh, hostilities that have to be there? How is that going to play out? Yeah, I agree with that completely, and I, I really think that the the factionalism cannot be overstated like the the impact of that last time we saw something like this this is going to sound like a strange comparison but honestly um the the end of the afghan you know regime uh just two years ago really was a lot about the factionalism within the army uh within the the intelligence services you know you know it was inter-ethnic in the case of afghanistan in the case of Russia and sort of, I guess, the, the former Soyuz, as we say, uh, it's a little bit more about kind of like inter, inter-mafia kind of clan tribal violence, basically. That's, that's the best way I would describe it. And, and this has been like a tradition in sort of Russian military culture for a really long time. It well predates, you know, Putin. It, it goes all the way back to the Boyars and, you know, the Tsar and so forth, right? Like, so... Uh, I mean, Catherine the Great and her great lover, uh, you know, I mean, it's just you name it, like there's just so many stories about this. So I guess from my perspective, like that, that factionalism that Ben was just describing, you know, and the effect on morale, right? And then the, the hard choices these guys are going to have to make um, as things kind of get hard in the wintertime. I, I don't envy any of the commanders on any side, uh, but I definitely don't envy, envy the commanders uh, who you know are on the front line of contact with Ukrainian forces right now um, and fighting for for Kremlin the Kremlin. I just I think they really um, are are walking into a wall. You know, on Saturday, Putin invoked the 1917 revolution and kind of rewrote history a little bit about a stab in the back, and you know, didn't really explain that but um you know that must have been what was on his mind and the 1917 revolution of course was prompted by russia essentially losing world war one and leading to soldiers mutinying so that and and of course putin is a student of russian history even if he often uh, expresses views that make no sense like ukraine has never had been an independent part of uh never had any independence but it must be playing heavily on his mind. You mentioned the Afghan, uh, Afghanistan, Candace, obviously 1989, Soviets pull out, you know, the Berlin Wall falls, down, uh, falls the Soviet Union implodes within two years. Uh, 19, you know, the Romanovs lose the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. They also lose World War I and they're put in front of a firing squad in 1918. So all that must be playing on his, on his mind. What do you think, Candace, he... <sighs> What he know he knows that he's got a big problem. I mean, he, he he's not winning the Ukraine war. He may well be losing it. Um, you know, what can he do to reverse this big problem he has, which he's got a, a losing war or a war he's not winning. He's got this, you know, the Wagner Group, and he's shown to be weak. And the security service you mentioned when we were talking earlier before the program, you you suggested that. There may have been some degree of collusion with other parts of the security establishment because he just cruised to Moscow so quickly. So what what does Putin have to do to reestablish his control? Mm. Well, you know, Peter, it's interesting that you mentioned the Bolshevik Revolution. I will say that, again, just keeping in mind that he's a St. Petersburger, right? Like, so he he grew up in that city. And in his mind, there's lots of stories in St. Petersburg. Obviously, the siege uh, during World War II is like, you know, it's kind of the weave of his psychology because his father and his mother suffered so greatly from it, right? Uh, we all know that kind of story about him. But one of the things, uh, and this is like real narrow, you know, deep cuts, Russian history stuff. Um, but for most people who've ever lived in St. Petersburg, they will know that the Kronstadt Rebellion of 1921 uh, was kind of a major flashpoint 
in the evolution of the, the Bolshevik party's kind of uh, rise to power. And exactly as you say, it was uh, it was actually the way in which Russia was prosecuting the war against the white Russians that um, mm. was the matchstick there that lit that tinderbox. And you know th these sailors in Kronstadt in, in the Gulf of Finland, just a little bit north of uh, of Saint Petersburg, uh, basically you know rebelled and 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 held forth. And I think what he probably was flashing back to was that moment. To be honest with you, I, I'm pretty confident that that's what was going through his mind, um, because any I think any good student of Russian history will know that that was extremely important. Um, in terms of the reversal, you know, there's nothing he can do at this stage. I mean, there's no, there's no, you can't, you know, unwind the clock. You can't sort of turn it back. There's for him, you know, politically, he is beyond a lame duck, right? Like he is just basically politically dead. I, I don't see, um, you know, him. Yeah. He could remain in power, right? Because it's useful for him. Um, but it's, it's pretty clear that there are other factions, um, both in the oligarchy and in the military and the secret services, right, that are kind of instrumentalizing him and the presidency. I'm not saying that he's not directing things. That's, of course, he's clearly directing things. But it, it he seems to be buffeted, right, by these, these uh, interfactional forces. And, and we saw this movie, you know, in, as you say, we saw it in 1905, we saw it in 1917, we saw it again in 1991 and 1993. Um, you know, those are the the four major points. Some people would argue Chechnya. Uh, I would just say that in terms of just the the Russian on Russian clash, pure and simple, those are the four points uh, where there was just no no returning. And I think we're kind of there, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, we typically try to avoid engaging in this kind of like speculation as to Putin's personal psychology because it's of extremely limited value. But if I may, just once. Uh, we 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 know that for for years, uh, Putin's great fear has been to wind up like Gaddafi in Libya, to wind up like Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And what happened uh, when you know this military this 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 mutiny came within roughly 100 200 miles of Moscow? Everybody fled. Um, all of all of the people that that Putin was relying on um, to sort of keep him safe, you know, they all got on their planes and 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 ran off to. Turkey or St. Petersburg or various other locations. Uh, and I think he's just in a, a tailspin right now. He doesn't he doesn't know what to do. He, he feels paralyzed. Um, that's why you get these weird things like yesterday. They're announcing, uh, you know, this is going to be the speech that will determine the future of Russia. And then Putin mm -hmm. pops on and talks for five minutes and then leaves. Um, and the other thing I just want to mention, um, we're already kind of moving on from this, but there was one very strange moment on Saturday where uh, Prigozhin had just taken over the city of Rostov and the Ministry of Defense building. And he releases a video of himself sitting down um, with two guys. One of them was um, Alexeyev, who's the deputy head of the Russian um, GRU, military intelligence. And he basically says, uh, you want Gerasimov, you know, take him. <laughs> His boss, right? You know, that's that's how deep these, these factions are, are now running in the Russian military, which is, I think, incredibly dangerous. And as Candace just said, I don't see how he puts that back together. Well, who who left? Um, because that that is because I mean, you saw these reports about planes leaving. But I mean, who uh, who who of significance left? I don't think we know yet. I mean, okay. I, I I will say that um, the signs that this is a real deal will be um, if you know the likes of um, uh, you know Nikolai Troshev or you know some of these other folks. That have been really close to him. We, we've been talking a little bit about Alexander Kuznetsov, uh, who goes by the call sign uh, Ratibor, uh, one of the chief commanders, and, and actually filmed many times on camera in Bakhmut, has become kind of a weird a secondary folk, folk hero, along with another guy um, named uh, Anatoly Yelizarov, who is also goes by the call sign uh, Lotus. He, he has been front and center, uh, along with Troshev, uh, along with uh, Kuznetsov uh, on camera much more this year than I ever would have predicted or expected. And so if we start seeing them appear somewhere in Belarus, then we know um, essentially that this is basically a kind of a sweetheart deal. And we should expect to see, I think personally, um, a, a changing of the guard in the Kremlin pretty shortly thereafter. That's my own feeling. 
we have half an hour left and a, a lot of questions. So I'm going to uh, get to those. Uh, let me start with this one from Daria. Uh, she asks, um, do you think this will be an excuse to shut down the internet? The prosecutor's office was on it, removing Wagner from media on, and online platforms, et cetera, during the mutiny. Yeah, I love that question. Um, thank you, Daria. <laughs> um, because I thought it was really funny that there was like this announcement. I think we stumbled across it when we were looking at Telegram, maybe. And there was some announcement that um, all of Yevgeny Prigozhin's patriot media outlets have been you know, crushed and, and taken offline. And it did appear that they were taking some things down. So, you know, a few of the contacted groups that we had been following uh, seemed to be stripped away. But listen, the, the empire is so huge. It's it's kind of hard. It's, un, it's kind of hard to quantify like what's there, right, Ben? I think ultimately, sure, there's this stuff that we know he owns through uh, known shell companies. And then there's a bunch of stuff that we don't know about at all. There's like random websites. Um, listen, there's stuff even on .su, like the old Soviet, uh, you know, registry, domain registry, where, you know, they talk to each other and all that stuff happens. So I honestly think, you know, perhaps they, they pretty quickly realized that it was a bit of a futile act and that they wouldn't be able to pull it off. And sure, uh, shutting off the internet, totally possible but then like how do you communicate <laughs> how do you you know right like the problem for them is the problem that any country would have if they were in the middle of an emergency and then you shut off the internet like hmm you know you just don't know what you're cutting off and then you can't communicate during a crisis yeah there the the laws on free expression on the internet are already pretty severe you hear all these stories of like some poor random person who lightly criticizes the the war and end up with like a 10 year sentence. Um, so there's plenty of tools in their toolbox already. Um, it was, yeah, as Candace said, they they took down a bunch of contactee groups that we had been following for a while, some big ones, but there's still a bunch of others that are still up because it's like playing whack-a-mole. There's so many of them. Um, many of them sort of organically springing up, unclear what their their actual uh, relationship, if any, to the, to the existing Wagner core. And then also you have the spectacle of, you know, so all across Russia, they have essentially recruiting advertisements on billboards, on walls. And on Saturday, they took them all down. And on Sunday, they put them all back up. And it's like recruitment appears to be continuing. It speaks to this incredibly strange situation where one of the most, this, this military formation that has been valorized extensively um, in Russia um suddenly turns around and, and potentially comes close to th overthrowing the government um it put, puts you in this very like almost schizophrenic state um <laughs> yeah um another question from daria um what does a coup mean for wagner operations in the middle east and africa which are obviously extensive and candace you've dug into those very extensively yourself yeah. Um, so first of all, I, I think I would call this a mutiny before I would call it a, a coup, um, because, you know, we don't know yet who, as we said, you know, allowed these forces unopposed uh, to move forward. So it's it's Prigozhin's mutiny and somebody else's coup. That's, I think, the first thing to point out. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for Africa and like all these operations in the Middle East, again, I would just sort of say that uh, Belarus has always been a really important hub, basically since the pandemic, when it became kind of complicated to move around. Um, uh, Minsk was a really important hub for, for operations. And, um, you know, maybe because, it, look, it, it's not an open book, Belarus. Like, it's it's not so easy to, to peer into uh, what's happening. I mean, I think there are a lot of journalists and I'm certain a lot of Russian uh, analysts and investigators who are kind of trying to dig in there. Uh, I, I I will personally say I'm finding it challenging um, to figure out what's happening because the the information environment is so locked down. Uh, we've been looking and looking and looking, and um, but I think you know, in a few months' time, you know, it will become pretty evident that they're still relying very heavily on the smuggling. Uh, that takes place in in car uh, in sudan um you know mali we know that weapons are kind of like flowing back and forth now 
and that that will be very key for resupply for whatever they plan to do, uh, potentially sort of in western Ukraine um, or you know around the Kyiv region. And um, we also know that it will be extremely important in terms of just continuing to build hard currency flows vis-a-vis uh, -vis the gold smuggling that's been going on and the gem smuggling that's been going on uh, for a long time. But Ben, you've also been looking at this. Yeah, in like the immediate, just last couple of days, I've uh, it seems mostly as though things have been operating as usual. I think on Sunday, maybe yesterday, uh, somebody spotted on um, you know an Emercom this government ministry that has a long and deeply intertwined history with Wagner. Uh, one of their planes landed in Mali and you know deposited more Wagner guys. So things in the very short term seem to be operating more continuity than change. But for me, this is one of the biggest medium to long-term questions because the Wagner forces across Africa and elsewhere are, are, you know, they're a major part of Russia's foreign policy. And so it's an open question to me whether um, Prigozhin or, you know, an entity that is known as Wagner will be permitted to hold on to that. Um, I think that's a huge, huge open question and, and has potentially sweeping ramifications for the countries where they operate. Question from Matt, which is an interesting one, which is, you know, uh, related to the spilling of Russian blood, he's, he's asking, uh, to what extent is Wagner ethnically Russian, or is it or is that a factor at all? I mean, so, I, I look, I think that we can't know all the things, but I think it's predominantly Russian. Uh, we know that it's, it's, you know, a thousand percent, you know, Russian speaking. Um, yes, there are some Ukrainians, for sure. Um, and we've, of course, we've looked at, again, this is based on some of the social media data that we've examined uh, and some of the claims uh, these users who follow the Wagner Group make about who they are, what they like, you know, um, their past histories and so forth. And we've seen, you know, so Russia is the, high, the most prevalent, you know, and then Ukraine. Uh, we also have seen intimations that there might be some Germans, there might be some Serbians, but largely this is a Russian and Russian speaking for us. And that's really all that really matters. But so, in in fact, the Wagner Group, based on what you're saying, Candace, is probably more ethnically homogenous than the ordinary Russian military, which does seem to be made up of a lot of different ethnic groups, particularly the ones that are fighting in Ukraine. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess I kind of think of it more as linguistically unified, I guess, is kind of more how I think about it. Like, Russian is the main for most of the people who are in Wagner, whereas um, you could think of like parts of um, some of the forces that are being drawn from like central uh, Russia around Siberia, you know, or even, you know, parts of uh, Chechnya, right? Like they got a second language. They can, you know, so that, you know, that I guess is the distinguishing factor. Um, but these are folks who are, you know, kind of all about Russia as the mother tongue, which has its own sort of weird um, social resonance that's a little bit like how the French think about language, not to be you know too brutal about it, but it's there's a bit of a purist streak going on there. Now, um, so we 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 hear a lot about Wagner, but my impression is is that there are other private private military contractors like Gazprom apparently has its own contracting. Um, other other groups like Wagner in the Russian military system um, and. Do I mean, do they have any kind of ability to operate independently or, you know, is other is there a Wagner one Wagner two that we'll start hearing about uh, in the in the near future or medium term? Uh, so we definitely could see like a totally different brand come, you know, move forward. Right. Like it could just be like Wagner is gone. It, you know, we don't know when that's going to happen, but it's I think we've long thought that that's a possibility that it's sort of something that's it's, you know, the, the brand Wagner is as expendable as Prigozhin himself in some ways politically, right? And so, uh, and the evidence of this is simply that we know that there are these other PMCs like um, PMC Redut, which is basically attached to the 45th uh, Army Division. Uh, you know, they've been operating in Ukraine for a very long time, in and out of Ukraine. They've been they were in Syria too, um, and they're. They're pretty serious. They're they're a little bit of a different animal, uh, and they have kind of a longer history, uh, and they represent a particular faction. But they too have worked for Gazprom. They've worked for Stroytrans Gaz. Um, so, I kind of think I've always thought of this as 
the SOGAS army writ large. Um, and SOGAS is the largest insurer for Russia that happens to have been a subsidiary of Gazprom. It's one of these strange, you know, kind of things. And so, you know, I know people have been talking about, oh, there's now a Gazprom army, but that's more, that's, that's just propaganda, frankly. Like, there's always been a Gazprom army. Uh, and, you know, since at least 2007, when there was a law in the books allowing Gazprom, Rosneft, uh, Rostec to stand up their own security divisions. Um, but because these are state enterprises, and literally, I just want to emphasize this point that's really important. Um, the CEO of Gazprom is presidentially appointed. I mean, you know, it's not Blackwater, guys. It's just not. The president of the United States does not, like, appoint, uh, you know, the CEO of ExxonMobil and then have him raise his own army. It's just not an equivalent. So I think it's really important to make that distinction. One, yeah, so just a quick little add-on to that. Um, one of the, the interesting things that has come out of the events of the last couple of days is basically all pretense of Wagner as a non-state sort of run entity have been dropped. Today, mm -hmm. Putin has literally came out and said that they had funded it to the tune of something like a billion dollars. Um, and then the, the man I mentioned earlier, Alexeyev, uh, on Friday night when Wagner was marching towards Rostov released a video um basically like pleading with Prigozhin you know you and I we've been co coordinating for so long again this is the deputy head of <laughs> Russia's military intelligence um you know so just all pretense of of just how close this relationship with the Russian state is has seemingly been dropped yeah which certainly complicates Putin any I mean a, a potential war crimes trial against Putin I mean his own statements about how much support he gave the Wagner group presumably would be pretty useful for prosecutors Hundred uh, percent. I, I mean, what's very interesting is, I, I just sort of you know these little voice memos and like you know all the filming of the you know the different people that he's associating with and trying to cajole and convince. It, it's as if there's no thought to the prospect that in fact like he's he's really writing the script for the prosecutors um, who are who are looking at him, and that's largely a function i think of the fact that they they could not operate without social media now right like that because it, it's it's a social movement we've said that all along that one of the i guess sort of magic tricks that prigozhin has performed with some help right with the help of uh, konstantin malafeyev with the help of uh, you know uh, borodai who of course is a member of uh, the duma one of these really extreme sort of ultra conservatives you know, uh, even Gherkin, even though they don't, they obviously clash and they don't get along and there's, you know, there's a big kind of separation there. Um, but the magic trick that Prigozhin has performed is that he has created an identifiable symbol, right? We've got the skull, we've got the, you know, sledgehammer, we've got the mask guys, we've got the gray zone. So all that stuff, it's, it's a little bit like McDonald's, right? Like it's literally like he's the Ronald McDonald of this war and he has created this thing that people can, can get behind and be like, I want my Big Mac of, you know, Russian aggression. And, you know, it's it's really like, so that magic trick is extremely important. And I, and I think that basically um, they, they wouldn't be able to survive without that. And so they're in this strange catch 22 that they may not yet understand, but they probably will if they're ever bought, brought to, uh, to justice in the tribunal. Any lessons for president, Chinese president Xi? Hmm. Um, think twice before you hire Russia to develop your paramilitary force, I guess. One thing we've <laughs> talked about in the past, Candace, is, I mean, the Chinese have, you know, even though they could afford to, really haven't engaged in proxy warfare in the way we understand it. I mean, in terms of having these private military contractors carry out um, state, you know, kind of aims. Uh, I mean, it, do you think Putin... Um, I, I, you know, when you look at, let's say, the Assad regime, there are multiple intelligence agencies, because when you're a dictator, the one thing you fear most is a military coup. So they're all sort of spying on each other. And presumably this is part of the way that Putin has operated. But, um, you know, do you think there's a, a world in which he would say, well, that didn't work out very well? Uh, I'm going to, you know, sort of reform things. I mean, I guess this July 1st MOD order to put Wagner inside the Russian military was an attempt. Presumably, Putin must have ordered that ultimately, right? Or, or not? Mm. 
I think Putin acquiesced to it. I don't think he ordered to it, ordered it. Yeah. I think he acquiesced to the, the pressure and basically, you know, because you know, it's been years that these guys have been off the chain and unleashed. And, you know, it wasn't until Bakhmut that really it became a problem for Shoigu, right? And it was kind of a problem in Syria, but not really. It wasn't a big problem. Uh, lots of people have theories about that 2018, uh, you know, clash between U.S. forces and, and Wagner forces. But there's a lot behind that story that doesn't quite fit with many of the theories out there. Um, on, on China, a couple little two finger things, I guess I would just say, um, quite a few Russian contractors actually work for Chinese companies. Um, you know, if you're if you're a pretty uh, adept Russian operator, you could make some pretty good money um, and you can make it by, uh, you know, doing this Belt and Road Initiative uh, protection services. And we, you know, they're present in Pakistan. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons that they're in Afghanistan. So there's a relationship there. I'll just point that out. And it, there's actually been some pretty good scholarship uh, on this uh, by a, a few folks, actually. Um, so that's something to point out. And I guess from a just a kind of grand strategy perspective, you know, in China, no, it, there's no redo here. Like it's it's if Xi knows his business, which I feel like he does, um, he's going to see that this is a militarily weakened force and maybe more sees an opportunity uh, to kind of exert some more uh, influence over the Far East, which of course has been growing for years now. Uh, I mean, some people kind of call uh, parts of Khabarovsk and, you know, Vladivostok kind of like Manchu, the new Manchu quo, uh, practically, right? So uh, I don't know, Ben, what do you think about the Chinese factor? Yeah, I think China is is looking at Russia right now and is is seeing a much more brittle state than I think they thought, you know, a week ago, um, which has all kinds of potential strategic ramifications for them. I mean, one of them is uh, so China has long had some pretty serious security concerns uh, about Central Asia and its, you know, Xinjiang region. It's been quite afraid of sort of spillover from Afghanistan and so forth. At the same time, it's relied on Russia to be the security security guarantor for the region while it has invested more in you know economic measures maybe they're rethinking that there's all kinds of pieces like that uh because the relationship between china and russia is so complicated and extensive agree i mean if if there is a rethinking though i'll just you know just a, a slight nuance there it's not like rethink throw away because it's not an option for them right because tajikistan right there's so many bordering areas uh, where all that Belt and Road investment and just this long-standing set of relationships economically, um, when they when, when they're talking about rethink or we're, when we're talking about that, what we're not saying is, um, boom, you know, Putin's gone. Well, I guess we just, you know, we'll replace him, you know, and <laughs> that will be fine. It'll be much more subtle. It'll be a lot more about sort of, you know. Um, potentially exchanges of intelligence and information and kind of listening stations potentially in these border areas uh, that are extremely important to China's interests. I suspect that will be kind of the, the subtle tweaking that happens uh, in, in light of what's just occurred. Um, both of you have spent a long time, many years, investigating the Wagner Group and, and uh, working on Putin. And, and what do you think... Uh, the media is kind of missing right now um or the you know the kind of the narratives that that we've we've heard are they mostly correct um is there some kind of element of this that that you think is misunderstood well look i mean there's a, disti a distinction to be made between the russian media and then like the english language press and the international media i would say sort of the western press as it were uh, let me just say, first of all, hats off to Medusa. Okay, just hundred uh, percent insider project Medusa. Uh, these guys are pounding on a daily basis, and uh, the sourcing is fantastic. If you're not reading that, and you want, if you care about Russia, you want to know what's happening next, please read those. That's really important. Um, they're just so well sourced, and they're so incentivized because obviously it's their country, uh, and many of them have fo been forced into exile. And um, and so they're really running and gunning, and I think it's important to pay attention to them. I also want to just say also OCCRP, I want to give a shout out to them because actually they too 
um, have been really kind of ahead of the game in terms of understanding the grand um, picture. And on the kind of more traditional, either legacy press, I guess, in the West, um, I think what they've really struggled with is the private part of the private army conceptualization. Um, and I think they're, you know, in varying degrees, they're just really behind the curve on that, to be honest with you. Uh, I keep repeatedly sort of hearing, you know, but isn't it like Blackwater? I don't know how many times I've answered that question uh, over the last several years. I know Ben uh, too. I mean, it's just, it's a frustration because in actual fact, um, the, the comparison is just so wrong and it just, it does an injustice. Um, and, and more importantly, what I think is fascinating is watching how there are some media outlets, very big ones, I'll give you examples, New York Times, Washington Post, um, they have really invested, right, in, uh, and BBC too, I would just recognize them. Uh, they've really invested in covering, not just this war, but covering Russia, right? They're just, they, they never let go of that tradition, that grand tradition. They kept it up, um, despite the fact that, like, it, nobody gave, you know, uh, two squats about it. And, uh, you know, in the middle of Iraq and Afghanistan. And, that has served them well, right? We've seen uh, fantastic reporting from Catherine Belton, uh, Carlotta Gall, our old colleague from Afghanistan, um, you know, Tryanovsky, right? Like some really fantastic reporting um, because they're on the ground doing this stuff and they get it. However, I, I would like to see them breaking through and starting to ask some of these hard questions about these specific commanders, because frankly, um, you can spend all your time focused on Prigozhin Right, uh, and you'll and you will completely miss the forest for the trees if you're not looking at these kind of mid-level commanders or upper-level commanders that are just below him. Uh, and also, I think you need to start reading the tea leaves when it comes to uh, the many, many dissident uh, activists out there, Russians, who are 100%. They're lightning years ahead on on this story. And I'll just name here Vladimir Osiechkin in particular, um, who on Gulagu.net has been narrating this um, before anybody else could, uh, has some of the best sourcing out there. And there's two quick things also that I think have really been missed in the English language media uh, about this. One is the extent to which this was, I think, pretty clearly pre-planned, likely for months. Um, there's all, all kinds of tidbits that are beginning to come out, and I think we're going to learn a lot more about that in the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, this was not a spur of the moment decision. Um, and some of the people who who actually seem to have taken part in this, who are posting on Telegram, are talking about how they had drawn up plans to occupy various like ministry buildings in Moscow. And you know, there was this whole sort of sequence of events that got cut, sh cut, sh cut short. And the second thing is just like the extent to which this is not over. I think there's a tendency to like, you know, everyone's trying to like wash their hands and, and look at this in retrospect. I think this is a story that is still happening. And the next shoe to drop might be weeks from now, might be months from now, but it's probably not years from now. This is more more is more to come yeah and of course there was the reporting uh including by uh new america fellow shane harris that u.s spies learned in mid-june that Prigozhin was planning armed action in russia so um that i think sort of helps buttress what you just said ben yeah i'm a little bit worried about that narrative i feel like that's a little convenient, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, it's, I think, I certainly get the sense that, uh, you know, inside the US government, inside the Biden administration, uh, the lights are on, people are paying attention. Uh, there's there's real effort being thrown at this uh, in ways that, you know, hadn't happened in, in previous administrations. <laughs> I must say, when I saw Biden come out and say, the United States had no role in it, I, I, I get what they're trying to do. But if you're a conspiracy theorist, that just merely confirms that the U.S. <laughs> behind it. But it is interesting that Putin hasn't really sort of, has he gone down the route of blaming? He talked about the stab in the back, and he's talked about. I mean, has he said anything that would implicate the West, or is he sort of staring away, steering away from that for the moment? It's so garbled and like really just off. I mean, I think even for Russians, like it sounds like nails on a chalkboard when he says. Um, U.S. Nazis garble garble Bandera. Um, it's you know Bandera yeah. being Stephen Bandera, the the Ukrainian, of course, um, who has been like the boogeyman uh, of Russians 
forever, but also since the start of this this war. Who is he, Candace? I, I don't. I'm not familiar with his name. Oh boy! I. You know what? I feel like if I if I try and do that, I might be hearing from a lot of Ukrainian colleagues. So I think I'll just say okay. he's an important historical figure uh, during World War II, uh, who was involved in uh, trying to resist all kinds of things that were happen, happening on Ukrainian territory. I think I'll leave it there. This is a little bit of like a, an Israel-Palestine thing, so I think I'll just stop. Okay. Um, but yeah, so Putin's, he's gone, gone to the neo-Nazi well. Um, is there any other well that he's, that he's gone to in the last, since Saturday to try and well, kind of explain? This. The whole like the, the neo Nazi piece is so weird because they actually are neo Nazis, and so you know because there's a lot of this symbology that the Wagner Group uses. They you know of course we know famously like uh, Dmitry Utkin. We see the, the the photos of him. Whether that's really him, I guess that's him. I don't know. People say it's him, and he has like you know the SS uh, symbols on his neck and like you know creepy stuff basically. Um, so it's strange, but that's that's the bizarro world of you know, Vladimir Putin's uh, through the looking glass universe, right? So you just don't know. Well, yeah, Nazi does not mean what it means here in Russia. In Russia, it means anti-Russian, right? Exactly. They, they defeated the Nazis. Therefore, definitionally, they cannot be Nazis, even though a significant chunk of their armed forces have, as Candace just said, neo-Nazi affiliations. Right. We have uh, three minutes left. Just uh, Candice and, and Ben, can you, uh, any kind of final thoughts before we wrap it up? Yeah, look, I mean, I think we all, um, at least on our team, you know, we've been looking at uh, the Wagner Group and how they fit into the grand strategy for, for several years now. And I would just say, uh, I, I think I sensed that this summer was going to be a pretty important moment for uh, Prigozhin in large part because once Bakhmut was done, his political capital was going to be kind of fungible. And 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 look, it, it, you know, I'm not saying that I have ESP. I really don't necessarily. But I, I do think that you can kind of read some of the tea leaves uh, and some things I would really start to expect to see that I think we should just keep our eye on. Um, if we're starting to see more mentions of a, a guy named Alexander Duman, uh, who is largely being talked about as a potential successor for, for Putin and has been for many years now, uh, he's the governor of Tula, and you know people have been chattering about the idea that maybe he's behind this in some way. If we start to see that narrative pick up, um, I would just, my own wager is more acceleration on that, that narrative is you know more likely action against the Kremlin that results in Putin in some way being sidelined or eliminated. We don't know how it's going to turn out, but I think that's one thing to watch. Yeah, um, I think exactly on the same page as Candace with that. Uh, I know sort of the question in everybody's mind is: Is this the beginning of the end for Putin? And I, I think you know. Never prognosticate, but um, I think it is. I think this is the beginning of the end for Putin. Um, and it, whether it takes months or years to play out, I think in retrospect, well, this will well, I mean, really the invasion of 2022 is that was the beginning of the end. But this is like a major inflection point. Yeah, I guess I'd say this. It's episode 12 uh, in, a, in like a 14 uh, episode season. Yeah. Of course, the 1917 revolution played out in two parts. So, I mean, um, yeah, it did. I mean, I'm taking away that this is not over yet from both of you. Not over by a stretch. Well, thank you. We know this has been a very busy <laughs> several days for both of you. So thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with our audience. And thank you very much, Candice. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank, thank you. you.